Thank you. I have to um, wonder what Frank said when, uh, when Ian finishes, there will be chaos. <laughs> It has been a wonderful weekend. I think it's great to obviously all be in the same venue as well, where, uh, although next time I do not want to share a room with Scott Tips. <laughs> he, he snores like crazy. <laughs> we were throwing stuff at him in the night to try and... <laughs> so if I fall asleep, it's not because... <laughs> it's just because I wasn't getting sleep out the back. Now, uh, it is the last lecture, um, and if uh, I'm obviously going to try and work through, try and um, keep to my original time schedule, maybe even a little quicker. If I see people starting to go, do a Scott, then um, I'll know that it's sort of time to, uh, to wrap up. But it's been an absolute pleasure to uh, chat with you, to sit down and uh, eat with you, to exchange views. And what's really, really impressive is, of course, that the whole conference has been conducted in a language other than your first language. In fact, for some of you, I know it's your, you know, not even your second language, it's your third language and fourth language, which is really, really impressive for me because, you know, the old saying, a, a person who speaks three languages is trilingual, a person who speaks two languages, of course, is bilingual, and a person who speaks one language is English. <laughs> or American. <laughs> oh no, the French, are getting the French are getting a lot better. When I was working with uh, in the oil industry in Paris, I had a colleague, an American, he'd lived in Paris for eight years. And of course, the, unfortunately, the language of the oil industry is ostensibly English, with the exception of um, West Africa, where it's French, and uh, Latin America, where it's Spanish. But the standing joke in Paris was that this guy could only ever go out with somebody else. He could never go out on his own because he only knew how to order de beer. <laughs> So uh, anyway, I'm, it's wonderful that uh, you, know, you guys have um, been able to uh, take on board everything you know, over such a lengthy period of time in a, a language other than your home language. And you know, I know we've had a very, very long day, so I say I will uh, watch out for people nodding off. So as Frank said, you know, it's no, I'm not, uh, I wasn't planning on sort of doing a roundup, but with any event like this, it's really quite remarkable how there is always a common thread and there's no collusion between the speakers, but it always is the case that you know, there's, a, there's a common thread running through. And it just so happens that uh, pretty much every one of the speakers um, has given a, an extensive explanation into some of the things that I'm going to give um, an insight into and to pull it all together. So the pieces of the jigsaw I'm going to bring together and show you how I perceive it to be as a, as a complete picture. And I'm also going to be discussing some things that are outside of my usual realm and you know this is an area that I've had an interest in for quite some time and in fact believe it or not I started talking about this material the non-material stuff before I started talking about the the geopolitical stuff 9-11 in 2003 but what I began to realize was at the time there was really no audience for it and you know I was only speaking with if you like the choir but earlier this year, I did a series of 19 workshops right across the whole of the UK, from Scotland right down to the southwest of England. 19 workshops, over 2,000 people, and what I'm going to do is this presentation is going to be an insight into uh, some of the content of, of that workshop. And I think what you'll see is it's very, very different from anything else that you've heard during the course of the weekend, but I, I absolutely am convinced that you will see the significance of what I present here. And you know, what is also fascinating for me is that now is the time for this material. 10, 12 years ago, it wasn't the time. Now is the time. And what is also fascinating for me is that you know, there are many, many people now talking about this kind of material. And again, there's no collusion. And everyone talks about it in a different way. Everyone presents it in a different way. Everyone focuses on different aspects of it. But nonetheless, there is a common thread. And once again, this is a, an indication that we're all tapping into something. So the, the title of the talk is, We Must Be Out of Our Minds. Well, of course, everything that we've heard during the course of the weekend, you know, we really must be out of our minds to actually acquiesce to it, to permit it. And as I said yesterday, you know, the three most powerful tools that those who perpetrate this agenda have in their armory are in our control, which is the apathy, the willful ignorance, and the abdication. And 
this is very important for those who perpetrate the agenda because their belief system is very, very different from anything that is in the public domain. And a part of their belief system is that they actually have to tell us what it is that they're planning on doing. They actually have to put it in the public domain. Now, that doesn't mean to say they have to put it on the front page of the newspaper. They can put it out in the most obscure form, but nonetheless, it's out there. And when there is no reaction, they take that as a mandate to then pursue that particular agenda. And actually, what's happening is they're starting to become more arrogant, more aggressive in putting out this information, which is working in two ways, because when it's ignored, it gives them, in their belief system, even more power to implement that agenda, but it's also helping us to be able to wake people up, to get them to or stimulate their own curiosity to take a deeper look at what's actually occurring. So as you'll see, this phrase, we must be out of our minds, is going to have two very different connotations as, uh, between the start of the presentation and the end of the presentation. And what I'm going to show you is the brilliance of the construct, the brilliance with which this agenda is being perpetrated. Take nothing away from them. It's absolutely incredible. But also why they are getting very worried. You know, Zbigniew Brzezinski, two years ago, two, two and a half years ago, in May of 2010, he made two presentations, one at the Council on Foreign Relations and one at the Bilderberger meeting in Sidges. And basically, he made the same statement in each of these meetings. He said, the biggest obstacle to establishing the one world government is the rapid political awakening of the masses. Now, he made another observation 40 years ago, which I'll share with you a bit later, which is also very significant. But nonetheless, this observation, which you can find, it's in the public domain, you can download on YouTube, but he made a comment, the rapid political awakening is the biggest obstacle to establishing the global government. And they're behind schedule, because their original intention was to have global governance in place by now. And in fact, the original vehicle was going to be global warming. That was going to be the vehicle which they were going to ride on the back of to establish the global governance. But, uh, and Copenhagen, the Copenhagen meetings of December 2009 were supposed to be the forum by which the foundations for global uh, governance was established, all on the basis of you know, the need to come together to fight this pernicious global warming agenda. But of course, something happened just two weeks before that meeting. The Climate Gate emails were released into the public domain, which immediately showed that the whole climate change, well, not climate change, the global warming agenda was a political construct. And the lies and the deceit of the academic community and the IPCC were laid completely bare. So that was a bit of a spoke in, uh, you know, in, the, in the wheel, if you like, to, to thwart their quest to establish global governance. So we've been given another opportunity. But something is happening. Something is happening which these guys are very, very concerned about. And it's something that's perhaps not quite so obvious to many people. But as we go through the course of the evening, I think you're going to realize that it's something that you guys are already participating in the process, and an increasing number of people are participating in this process. They don't take a conscious decision to start participating. Something happens, and that's what we're going to be exploring as we go through. So I'm going to start by a little experiment here. Take a look at this pirouetting lady here. Just look at it for a few seconds. Can you raise your hand if you are watching her rotate in a clockwise direction? Okay, can you put your hand up now if you are watching her rotating in an anti-clockwise direction? Okay, can you put your hand up if you've seen her rotating in both directions? And how many people can't see her moving at all? <laughs> ah, you laugh. Well, let me tell you what's going on here. And you can find this on the, on the web. 
so you can experiment with it yourself. If you haven't seen her rotating in both directions, take your focus from the head down to the heel of the foot that appears to go close to the floor here, and then bring your focus back up, and that may actually trigger a change in direction. What's actually happening here? Our optic nerves are linked to both sides of our brain, but only one side of our brain can feed information into our conscious mind at any given moment. So when we are seeing her rotating in a clockwise direction, at that given moment, it is the left side of the brain that is in the dominant role. If you are watching her rotating in an anti-clockwise direction, then that is the right side of the brain that's in the dominant role. Now, if I was to conduct this experiment in, the, in any random high street, the vast majority of people today would swear blind that they can only see her rotating in an clockwise direction and anything else any other suggestion is just outrageous because they can only see her rotating in a clockwise direction and that's because the vast majority of people have been programmed to operate primarily within their left brain and the right brain has effectively been shut down and that's what we're going to explore as we go, uh, go through the, uh, the course of the evening. If you can't see her moving at all, there wasn't anybody that put their hand up, was there? If you don't see her moving at all, now I've never seen this, but I am assured that it has happened. In martial arts, the word is tatsudin, the point of perfect balance. And for somebody who has achieved a mental state, maybe the Dalai Lama might uh, sort of get there, but that's about it, I think. But supposedly, if you've achieved the, the perfect balance between the left brain and the right brain, then you can actually see her just stationary. I think I've got a long, long, long way to go before that happens. <laughs> okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a couple of observations, but before I do that, I want to just get a straw poll here. How many people, uh, can I just have the hands up for all the males in the room under the age of 35? Oh, Oh, a bit too many. <laughs> okay, I'm going to make a couple of statements here. And let me tell you that if for the male under the age of 35, it is possible, it is possible that as I make these statements, you may feel a welling up of anger and frustration. And you might want to jump up and say, that's bollocks. And I know this happened because it happened in Australia. Where's Terry? Were you in that uh, presentation? You weren't in that one? Okay. When it was, actually, it was another speaker as well. <laughs> but if you do feel, as I make this statement, as I read out this statement, if you feel this sort of anger welling up in you, don't worry about it, because I will explain why you're feeling that way. Here's the first statement. Your left hemisphere of your brain is a hormonally retarded, perceptually limited, and cognitively impaired version of your right hemisphere. <laughs> well, it gets better. <laughs> your left hemisphere is perceptually dominant. It defines who you are, and it decides who you think you are. The left hemisphere... We tend to refer to the brain, but increasingly within neuroscience, there is a recognition. Well, in fact, neuroscience, to be honest, neuroscience is effectively dividing into two camps right now. There's the neuroscientists who are the materialists. And these are the neuroscientists, the humanists, if you like, who believe that everything everything can be explained by reductionist Newtonian science. And that there is absolutely no experience, whilst we are in physical form on this mortal coil, there is actually no experience that cannot be explained. Whereas the non-materialists are starting to say, well, actually, there's a hell of a lot that we can't explain. And what tends to happen is the materialist neuroscientists put a lot of time and effort into trying to demonize and marginalize and dismiss the research of the non-materialists 
whilst the non-materialists don't waste their time responding. And so within the non-materialist neuroscience camp, there is the increasing recognition that actually to refer to the brain is wrong. It's a misnomer. Because although we have an organ within the cranial cavity, it's actually two organs. The left brain and the right brain divided by the corpus callosum. And the increasing recognition is that these two sides of the brain perform very, very different functions. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that those who think they're the rightful rulers of the planet have actually known this for a long, long time. And so they've made a tremendous effort, a brilliant effort, to keep people locked in to the left brain, the seat of the ego. And a lot of research, the reason I've said about the under 35s, is a lot of research has shown that because of all the programming that takes place, for a lot of the male population, it's only when they get to about the age of 35 that they actually start to move away from the focus on the self and start to recognize that, you know, well, maybe there's other people and maybe they can enjoy life more if they open up to a uh, sort of uh, more open relationship with other people. But up until that point, and it's no fault of their own because it's part of the programming, they focus very much on the self. Now, just to develop this theme of the it defines who you are, let me just ask a question here. When you meet somebody for the first time, perhaps even over the course of the weekend, you've started up a conversation with somebody else, um, but not necessarily here, but elsewhere. When you meet somebody for the first time, after you've exchanged pleasantries, what's normally one of the first questions that actually gets asked? What do you, yeah, what do you work? What is your work? What do you do? What do you do? And what do we answer? <laughs> your job, exactly. The most common answer is your job. So what do you do? And we answer with our job. Isn't it interesting that we actually define ourselves by what enslaves us? Because for the vast majority of people, I mean, there are exceptions, of course, but for the vast majority of people, they're not necessarily, particularly in this climate, they're not necessarily doing a job that they particularly enjoy. They're doing a job because it's a means to providing your income to be actually keep, able to keep a roof over the head and food on the table. What would be a more, perhaps, challenging or interesting question? Who are you? Who are you? Yes, who are you? Has anybody ever tried this? Yeah, you tried it. And what, what reaction did you get? <laughs> Who do you think you are? For asking me the question. <laughs> well, you know, I tried it one time and it was really funny. I said to this guy, oh, by the way, by the way, I said, uh, yeah, who are you? And the guy went, um, uh, who, who am I? Um, uh, uh, oh, wow, that's a tough one. Um, and then he told me what he did for a living. So, you know, we're, again, we're programmed to actually simply identify the self by what we are employed at. Now, the programming of the, the self, the ego, is very sophisticated because it plays very much on our fears. It wants to create this division between us and everybody else. And it's very, very, very sophisticated. Because when we do meet somebody, hopefully within this group, it's not quite so prevalent, but in the public domain, what tends to happen is we're, as soon as we know we're going to talk to somebody, we're going through some kind of process, either consciously or subconsciously, which is saying, um, uh, am I better dressed than this guy? Is he better dressed than me? Does he look better than me? Does he earn more than me? You know, we're weighing up on a number of levels as to whether we perceive ourselves to be superior or inferior. Whether we're going to look up to this guy or look down to this guy. Or whether we're just going to perceive him as an equal. This is a natural process. Now what is interesting about these observations is that it's unique in the respect that it's a right brain explanation. Because my left brain doesn't feel threatened by the fact that I'm making the comments about the left brain's limitations. 
But I absolutely relate to what I said because there's no question that up until, I mean, I gave you the explanation last night, up until I was 34, I was the epitome of the corporate whore in every pretty much sense of the word. You know, and the, and the focus was my career. It was my career that provided the, the lifestyle for my family. And my career came first. And it took this massive wake-up call in, in Kuwait to start the process of shaking me out of that mythology. So this focus, this construct, of course, supports everything we've been talking about here over the last couple of days because it, we want to create a society that encourages people to define themselves by their material possessions. Because what we're trying to create is the good consumer. And of course, what does the marketing, what do the marketing campaigns focus on to try and get us to buy their shit? They focus on our fears. And our fears. And what is the primary fear that they focus on? You're not good enough, exactly. And more, more poignantly, not getting laid. <laughs> and I'm told that applies to both sexes. <laughs> I'm not going to have a debate on that subject. <laughs> I'm going to show you a photograph that was taken, I think it was a week or so, 10 days or so ago, in an area of very, very high unemployment in the UK. An area that is regarded as one of the poorest areas in the UK. A city of Liverpool. It's a lot better than it was, but nonetheless it's still regarded as uh, some way down the line. Look at this. This is the Apple store on the day of the release of the latest iPhone. Not a lot of evidence of poverty or austerity there, is there? Because they're queuing up to buy a 500 pound, what's that, about 5,000 kroner, a 5,000 kroner phone. And this is the result of the sort of phenomenal marketing campaign to launch you know, the, new, the new iPhone. Well, when I first started to get interested in this subject some years ago, I came across this book, Subliminal Seduction. And it was, the front cover says, are you being sexually aroused by this picture? Well, <laughs> no, don't think so. Think I'm okay. But the issue here is that whether or not you think you're being sexually aroused, supposedly the marketeers believe that this is the type of image that would get you sexually aroused and therefore get you to buy their products. And I'm going to show you a few ads here. And because I'm obviously sharing this issue with you, you know what you're looking for. So obviously it's going to be pretty blatant. But what you've got to take into account is that the vast majority of people don't look at an ad like they would a piece of art on a wall of an art gallery. It's something that is often just caught in the peripheral vision. And so the ad has to make an impact in that fraction of a second in your peripheral vision. And this is why today a neuroscientist can earn more working with a marketing agency than they can in academic research. And every major marketing agency in the US and the UK employs neuroscientists. Here's the first ad. I think this is for Gap Jeans. Obviously appealing to both sexes, if you wear Gap jeans, you might get laid. Here's something that's a little bit more um, blatant. If, unless you wear Tom Ford aftershave, you're not going to get down her cleavage. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> what happened? We have lost everything. Now, if I was a conspiracy theorist, <laughs> ah, we've got the mouse. Ah, there we go. Thank you. You may wave your magic wand. Yes. Or elsewhere. And with this aftershave, you might get real lucky.
Yes, it pushes the boundaries. Absolutely. Well, the marketing industry itself is beginning to recognize this. Here's an advert for a line of clothing, Slate's clothing. Now, what was really interesting about this particular picture is I walked into a bar in the UK and there was a row of beer pumps. And one of the pumps actually had exactly this as a 3D image on the beer pump, you know, within the, within the pump itself. And it was a row of about six beers. And I spoke to the barman and I said, look, forgive the question, but just out of interest, which one of these six beers do you sell most of? And without hesitation, this was actually Budweiser, without hesitation, he said, oh, Budweiser, no question at all. Now, Budweiser may be, I don't drink, but Budweiser may be a good beer. <clears throat> but I would suggest that this image within the 3D context of the pump actually contributed to the, uh, the sales. Here's uh, Samsung computers. Yeah, it has nothing to do with the computer. It has much more to do with the selling. Here's one, fairly close to home, across the water, although it's not an ad from Sweden, it's an ad from the US, but here's Volvo cars. <laughs> I can see we have a more aware audience here than in a certain other European country where I had to actually explain it. <laughs> now, the next, the next picture I'm going to show you is actually from a cinema. It's in one of these multi-screen complexes. Now, supposedly, and I will take this with a pinch of salt, but supposedly these three ads for films were not deliberately put up in this order. Personally, I think that's a crock. But anyway, consider that that's what the manager said. They weren't deliberately put up in this order. But when these films came into the cinema, these three films grossed as much as all the rest of the screens put together. Now, once again, bear in mind that, you know, when you walk down that long walkway to the doors where you go into all the cinemas, you're not going down the corridor going, oh, yeah, that's, mm -hmm, yeah, I must go see that film. Oh, and that one. You, you are marching down the corridor to get to your cinema to see your, your film. So once again, these ads are literally catching you in the peripheral vision. Now, here's one from Burger King in the US. Every aspect of it, every aspect from here to here to the BK Super 7 incher. Here's a collage of some of these ads, all from the US. Why? Because it is effectively scientifically proven that sex sells. That sex sells. When I was um, uh, pursuing this line of research with some of the marketing agencies and was talking about this, they were very, very proud of some of the ads that they had designed. And they showed me some of the ads, and every one of the ads supposedly, well, did have, because they eventually pointed out, but had the word sex embedded in the graphic. Now, some of them it was obvious. Some of them, I'm staring at it, and I just can't see it, until they pointed it out. And eventually, of course, once I got the, the drift and knew what I was looking for, I could see it straight away. Here's one for bread. Now, in the UK, we have the National Lottery. And this whole issue of morality in marketing came to the fore over this marketing campaign. A particular company, a company called Barnaby Barford, won the contract to market the lottery scratch cards. Now, in the UK, you cannot buy a lottery scratch card until you reach the age of 16. And actually, they're pretty hot on this. And you, if you look under 25, they will actually ask for your ID. But this marketing campaign was aimed at prepubescence, i.e. 9, 10, 11. 
Now, what the hell are they doing putting a marketing campaign together that markets scratch cards which can't be sold to people unless they're 16 to prepubescence? Now, what I'm going to show you is a graphic. It's not an advert, but this was a graphic that was used uh, on the front page of the article of Marketing Week. The big win, a morality tale. When we actually look at this graphic a little more, what we see is this mandala, mandala of the scratch cards. We have a child, a prepubescent, in the upside down crucifix position, and we have a slightly enhanced national lottery logo with the 666 clearly on display here. And the article was actually questioning whether or not the marketing industry was starting to go a bit too far. Well, following this article, the marketing industry actually commissioned its own survey into the fall in the standards of morality in marketing. And the, an article written by a, a British journalist called George Monbiot, um, he brought this uh, report into the public domain. And he took a quote from the report because one of the major contributors to this report was a guy called Rory Sutherland, who was president of the Practitioners in Advertising. And Rory Sutherland says in the report, he said, marketing is either ineffectual or it raises enormous ethical questions every day. It goes on, then with admirable or disturbing candor, Rory Sutherland concluded by saying, I would rather be thought of as evil than useless. Which pretty much says it all, doesn't it? In other words, you know, we are quite happy to prostitute ourselves. And then we wonder why it is that we're in the mess that we're in, you know, and we've heard all the presentations, uh, you know, about the GM foods and the vaccines and the chemtrails. We wonder how it is that this agenda can be perpetrated when you know, those who are working in these industries must have some idea of what's occurring. Well, they do have some idea of what's occurring. They know what's occurring. Like Rory Sutherland acknowledges, he would rather be thought of as evil than useless. And many people working in the pharmaceutical industry and the biotech industry you know, would rather prostitute themselves in return for their very nice standard of living, thank you, than actually recognize their responsibility to the wider community. And it, especially in times of um, economic hardship, a lot of people think, oh my God, oh my God, I've just got to keep my head down, not rock the boat, and maybe I can keep my salary and my pension. So unfortunately, the vast majority of us have at some time in our lives, and maybe sometimes still do, prostitute ourselves in return for the salary. You know, this is brilliant because right from the get-go, the effort is made to make sure that we understand that the most important thing is that we are a consumer, that we are locked onto that corporate teat. And I'm going to show you um, a poster here from the European Union. It actually appeared in three languages, in French, in Dutch, and in English. The English language version was uh, used in Ireland during the referendums in Ireland. Obviously, the French and the uh, Dutch versions were used in the run-up to their respective referendums on the EU. And you'll remember that the French and the Dutch both voted resoundingly no. They did not want to be uh, signed up to the EU treaty. But their government said, well, thanks for letting us know what you think, but we're going to do it anyway. In Ireland, they couldn't do that because up until the last referendum, their constitution required them to have a referendum to permit the national government to hand over any element of national power to a foreign entity. And these, this advert, the graphic of this advert, is very, very telling at a very, very deep level. I'm not even going to get into this. This is the geometry of Baphomet. 
This is exactly the same geometry as was used for the iconic Uncle Sam posters, Your Country Needs You, which obviously were used during the First World War. It's very clearly illustrating who it is that effectively they are operating under, whose belief system they are operating under. What is this? How do you know that? Okay, at least you didn't tell me that you'd seen the blueprints like somebody did. <laughs> Absolutely, it's based on this. This is Brugel's amazing artwork. And this has effectively become the defined vision of the Tower of Babel. Well, of course, the uh, EU tells us exactly where their loyalties lie because this is the parliamentary building in Strasbourg. And it is based exactly on Brugel's wonderful piece of artwork here. The EU is a Babylonian entity. The Vatican is a Babylonian entity. There are many, many good Christians within the Catholic Church, within the Roman Catholic Church, but there's nothing Christian about the Roman Catholic Church. There's nothing Christian about the Vatican. Why do you think Tony Blair converted to Catholicism? So that he can be the first elected president of the EU. This war criminal is being groomed to be the first elected president of the EU because he will do exactly what he's told, as he has proven over the last eight years. This tower in this graphic represents exactly the same as the separated capstone that I showed you yesterday on the back of the one dollar bill on the great, the great seal. This represents the bastion of the few where they retain the knowledge and the wisdom that will never be shared with the masses. The moat here represents the separation between the capstone and the rest of the pyramid. You see here, we have these guys in the gray suits. You know what that represents? That represents the names of anybody you know in the public domain. That represents the Bushies, the Shaneys, the Rumsfelds, the Blairs, the Camerons, anybody whose name you know in the public domain. And you see them standing there looking across longingly at the Tower of Babel. What have we got to do to get inside there? Well, they'll never get inside there because they're not part of the inner sanctum, but they will do anything anything to get in there. Tony Blair, if you want to ever see the magnitude of the socio-psychopathy of that individual, he was being interviewed by um, uh, one of the BBC's political interviewers. And this interviewer is not quite as dogged as Vincent, who you saw yesterday. But nonetheless, he's quite capable of asking the hard question. And in the interview, he said, so, Mr. Blair, how do you actually sleep at night knowing that it is because of your agenda and your statement that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, which it clearly didn't, but your agenda has resulted in something in the region of 500,000 Iraqi civilians being killed? And do you know what Tony Blair's response was? Uh, well, Andrew... I think you'll find it was only 100,000. Oh, so that makes it all right then. You know, any of us would be mortified if we thought we had done anything or said anything that caused any other person physical or even emotional harm or injury. Tony Blair can quite casually dismiss the fact that it's only 100,000. And Madeleine Albright, you're familiar with the Madeleine Albright interview where she was asked if she thought that the slaughter of Iraqi women and children was worth the price? And she said, well, it's a difficult decision, but yes, we think it's worth the price. This is the level of socio-psychopathy that we're dealing with. And these people are not part of the inner sanctum. 
And it is my opinion that those who are in the inner sanctum absolutely despise these individuals. You know, there's no word in the English language, no polite word, that describes these individuals, but there is a word in German. Camp Polizei. Camp Polizei. It was the term coined by the National Socialists in the, uh, in, uh, the, during the time of the Third Reich. And when they were setting up the Jewish ghettos, the Nazis didn't want to waste their own resources in managing the ghettos. So they appointed community leaders, Jewish community leaders. And they gave these Jewish community leaders better accommodation, better food, better clothing. And their job was to manage the ghetto, to administer the ghetto, which included providing the Nazis with the lists of the people to be shipped out to the camps. But when everybody had been shipped out, what happened to the Camp Polizei? They were, on the last, they were on the last bus out of town. They went the same way. And that's what these guys are. That's what the Blairs and the Bushes and the Rumsfelds, they, they, these guys ultimately are dispensable once they've served their purpose. And then we have here, we have the masses, the proletariat. But I know it's not in great focus, but do you notice something about the way in which the proletariat are depicted? Yeah. Square heads, block heads. But there is one exception. Do you see what that exception is? The baby. Yes, the baby. This is very, very telling. What this indicates is that it is recognized, understood, that every human, when they enter into this physical realm through the birth canal, they are born with the potential to access the full range the full range of their human capabilities and capacities. But God forbid that that ever happens. Because by the time they get to young adulthood, they have to be turned into the hamster. Keep running on that wheel. The consumer. You know, everything we talk about, everything you've heard about during the course of the weekend today, thanks to the internet, is available for everybody to take a look at. It's a two-edged sword, as I said earlier. You know, they put everything out there, and when we don't react, it's a mandate to do it. But the vast majority of people, even if they have the inclination to do this research, they don't have the time. And that's why those of us who are aware of what's occurring, in my opinion, have a responsibility to share it and to try and stimulate the curiosity, because you can't tell anybody anything. I mean, there's, I don't expect anybody to take anything I say at face value, and I'm sure the same would apply to all the other speakers here. That's not the objective. That's the role of the mainstream media, to tell people what to think. Our job is simply to try to stimulate sufficient curiosity so that people will go away and look at this for themselves, and they will come to their own realization, because it's only when they come to their own realization that it actually takes on a life for them. But this is the goal to make sure oh, wrong one to make sure let's try that to make sure that over the course of 18 years everything about this child is effectively engineered to create the consumer and that means absolutely locking people into this, to the belief that this is how people are supposed to spend their lives, with maybe a little bit, a little bit of R&R. &R. But this is where they're expected to focus their lives. And this effort starts in the UK literally within seconds, within seconds of the birth with the vitamin K vaccination. And Desiree is talking about the vaccinations. You know, in the UK now, a preschool child has to have 26 vaccinations. And many of these vaccinations are literally in the first months of birth. Well, you know, it's interesting. We're in a Steiner building here, you know, an anthroposophical building. And Rudolf Steiner, 100 years ago, made some very poignant observations. 
What he said was, he said, a way will be found to vaccinate bodies so that these bodies will not allow the inclination towards spiritual ideas to develop. And all their lives, people will believe only in the physical world that they perceive with their senses, their five senses. None of my kids have been vaccinated. I have made sure that they've all had the normal childhood diseases of chickenpox, measles, mumps, German measles, rubella. Because in my opinion, these diseases are absolutely crucial to the body building up its immune system. In the oil field, I've traveled all over the world. In many countries I visited, it was a requirement to have a certificate to say that you had been vaccinated against various rabies, malaria, whatever. I have never been vaccinated. Whenever I needed to go into these countries, I simply got one of my colleagues' certificates and created my own forgery. Apart from that, I have a pathological fear of needles anyway. <laughs> and I have never been ill. Well, that's a lie. Because the only time I was ill, and I was as sick as a dog, was at a party in Cairo, where my manager in Cairo threw a party and uh, got towards the end of the evening and he was running out of beer and I saw a beer on the end of the counter and I said, Is anybody's beer? Nobody answered, so I drank the beer. And then this guy came over and he said, Ian, did you pick up that beer on the end of the counter? And I said, oh yeah, sorry, was it, was it yours? He said, yeah, but it didn't taste very good. And I said, well, it tastes right to me. <laughs> he was right, I was wrong. I was as sick as a dog for the next three days. That was the only time I was ever sick. And yet my colleagues, some of whom have had all the vaccination, oh my God, it was you know, a real mess. At the end of the day, I'm not anti-vaccination, but what I am anti is the dogma of vaccines. In the UK today, at this moment, it's not mandatory for the children to be vaccinated. There is phenomenal social pressure Phenomenal pressure by the uh, medical profession to get the children vaccinated, but it is still uh, optional. And what Rudolf Steiner was really acknowledging here was that there is every intention of making sure that people remain locked into the physical, empirical, material realm. Now, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who I referenced earlier with his observation that... Um, the biggest obstacle to establishing the one world government is the rapid political awakening of the masses. In 1969, he wrote a book published in 1970. That book is called Between Two Ages, The Technotronic Era. It's an incredibly prescient book. If you can get hold of it, a hard copy, you pay about 200 plus dollars right now, but there's, fortunately there's more and more access to PDFs of it. It's remarkably prescient, especially when you consider when it was written. But he, in that book, he makes an observation. I'm going to paraphrase, so what I'm saying here is not a direct quote. But the paraphrase is, what he says is that the challenge for Western governments, remember this is 1969, the challenge for Western governments will be to keep their people locked into consumerist materialism, preventing them from realizing who they truly are. I think that's pretty telling. You know, what these guys are basically stating is that they have to make sure that we are locked into the left brain construct because if we start to access the full range of our capability and capacity, we might actually be a bit of a problem for them. Well, what I'm going to try and do through the course of this presentation is just get you to question some of the things that you take as sacred cows. So let me just ask a, a question here. How many people here believe that the earth revolves around the sun? The earth revolves around the sun? Okay, half of you. How many people believe that the sun revolves around the earth? One, yeah, okay. How many people actually don't really know? Well, of course, about 400 years ago, to suggest that the Earth revolved around the sun could have actually been quite costly in terms of your personal freedom, as, of course, Galileo found out. Today, of course, if you believe that the sun revolves around the Earth, then you will be ridiculed. 
Yet in reality, I've got to say that, you know, the proposition that the Earth revolves around the Sun seems to tick all the boxes, but I'm not an astronomer, I don't really know. I mean, it sounds like a plausible explanation, until I hear a more plausible explanation, I'll take it on board. Okay. Well, yeah, probably you're correct. But my point here is that at any given time, there is social dogma that we are expected to lock ourselves into and not step out of that. And if we step outside of that dogma, then we run the risk, obviously, of being ridiculed. In fact, we will be ridiculed because if we're right, especially, then the establishment will want to make sure that nobody else perceives us to actually have any particular insights. Yet, you know, more and more, we are starting to um, recognize that we are capable of having experiences that can't actually be explained. I mean, is there, is there anybody in the room who actually would put their hand up and say, I've never, ever had an experience in my life that I couldn't explain? So, by definition, everybody in the room has had an experience that you can't explain, yeah? Okay. And yet, how many people are quite happy to just randomly discuss those experiences with anybody they happen to run into on a casual basis? Oh, excellent. <laughs> excellent. It wouldn't happen in the UK, I can tell you. Because the social norm is that it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And if it did, then it can be dismissed as just luck or coincidence or maybe synchronicity. And yet, you know, you've all acknowledged that there have been events that you can't explain. The common ones, of course, the most common ones are, you know, somebody who you haven't seen in a long time and their name happens to come into your mind, and then within a few minutes or a few hours or later that day, the phone rings and they're on the phone, or you run into them in the street. Yeah? Everyone had that experience? Yeah. Another one that's very, very common, because more and more people are trying it, is that if you are going on a mission into town and you're a bit tight on time, but you've got to, say, go to the bank, and the town is normally really busy at the time that you, you're going in, but you really, really, really want a parking space outside the bank. And you think, oh, God, I really hope I get a parking space outside the bank. You drive into town, you can see that there's hardly any parking there at all, and then just as you're pulling up to the bank, somebody pulls out, and they've left your space. Anybody had something like that? Yeah. This is normal. But don't go trying to tell this to your doctor. Because they will probably prescribe you something. Well, a little over a decade ago, in fact, it was when I was in Central America, I was having a conversation with my son because something had actually happened which was truly remarkable. We both had this experience, and we, it was a, a mutual experience, something that we couldn't explain. And we were traveling from... Um, uh, Guatemala, in Antigua in Guatemala, down to Copan in Honduras. And we spent the whole four hours talking about experiences that we had, things that had happened in our lives that we couldn't explain. A causal events which happened to have some kind of connection, but we couldn't actually explain how they happened. And we were trying to explain it. We were looking at all the reasons why it might have happened, but we couldn't explain it. Anyway, I happened to mention to my son, I said, you know, Dan, I said, actually, there was some research on this particular field that was conducted at Stanford in the 1970s by a couple of guys called Russell Targ and Hal Puthoff. And I said, these guys were very interested in looking at sort of paranormal phenomena. And one of the things that got them interested in it was because they knew this subject was being researched in Russia, but there was, to their best of their knowledge, there was nothing similar going on in the US. So they approached Stanford and uh, they got a small grant and were told that that was all they were going to get, but they could start the pro project, and if they needed any more money, then um, you know, they would have to find another way to raise it. Well, they were working with a guy called Uri Geller. Has anybody heard of Uri Geller? Yeah? Uri Geller? Well, he's um, uh, an Israeli, now resident in Britain, Britain, but his claim to fame was that basically he could bend spoons or start watches. But his real party trick was to be blindfolded, and he could be put in, it was put in a car, and he would drive around an obstacle course. 
Now, initially, when they tried this with him in the, in, uh, in the first instance, the obstacle course was just made up of these plastic bollards, and he would you know, drive fairly gingerly around the bollards. But over the course of their work with Geller, Geller got more and more confident, and eventually they started to put more solid obstacles. And he was always able to ne negotiate this obstacle course. And then as he got really cocky, because he was in his like, 20s, 20s or so at the time, he got really cocky, and he would drive the car around the campus blindfold. I mean, this was with a, a helmet. There was a blindfold, a helmet, and a blacked-out visor. Anyway, one day he said to um, one of the, like, I can't remember which of the lecturers it was, he said, hey, you want to try an experiment? Um, you know, we'll drive around the campus. So the guy said, yeah, OK. So he got in the car with Geller, and Geller just put the accelerator to the floor. And it went, came up to the junction, slammed on the brakes at the last minute, turned the car, and he drove around the campus like this for 10 minutes. When they finished, I think it was Targ, when, when they finished, his face had drained of blood. And Geller, of course, was, was laughing. So anyway, Targ decided he was going to get his own back. So what he did, he got a concrete block and put it in the road in a random location on the campus. And on a Sunday afternoon, when he'd um, you know, managed to make sure, of course, the roads were clear, he said to Geller, he said, hey, you know that experiment we did the other day where you drove me around? He said, do you want to do it again? So uh, Geller said, um, yeah, okay. So this time, he went to get in the car, but didn't actually get in the car. But as he was climbing in, he said, okay, okay, Uri, off you go, and shut the door and stay back. So Geller drove, drove off, and of course he must have realized that uh, he, he didn't have the passenger. But he drove off, drove like crazy, drove around the course, came up to the straight where the concrete block was, and uh, accelerated. And of course Targ's like, oh my God, oh my God, what have I done, what have I done? Geller came up to the concrete block, slammed on the brakes, and stopped that far from the concrete block. Well... Targ and Putoff decided they needed to get some extra funding, so they wrote a book. And that book was called Mind Reach. And that was published in 1975, but it barely got onto the shelves when the National Security Agency in the US sequestered the research and effectively classified the research. And they classified it for the next 20 years. So immediately, all copies of that book, Mind Reach, were pulled from the stores in the US. So I was talking to my son, I said it would be amazing to get hold of one of those books that actually made it onto the shelves, because when it was re-released, republished in 1996, it had been sanitized, and a lot of the real interesting stuff had been taken out. And Daniel said, well, you know, how many, how many books do you think actually made it onto the shelves? And I said, well, you know, I don't know, a few hundred, a few thousand. I said it wasn't as though you know, it was going to go on the New York Times bestseller. Anyway, we arrived in uh, Copan. We spent the day at the uh, Mayan ruins in Copan. And then that evening, I said to my son, I said, what do you fancy eating tonight? He said, pizza. I said, Dan, we're in Central America, not Italy. He said, no, no, I want pizza. Anyway, we go into the town. It's only a small town. We walk into the main square, and we can smell pizza. So we walk down the, uh, uh, follow the smell, and we go into about a block back, and it's a youth club. And in this youth club, the kids have got a pizza oven, and it had apparently been provided to them by the local community so that they could cook pizzas and make a little money for their youth club activities. Well, we're sitting down waiting for the pizza, and there's a bookshelf in the corner. And, of course, Copan's on the backpacker's trail, so it's you know, part of the book exchange system. Where, you know, if you're traveling, you don't want to carry a whole library, so you know, if you've got a book you've read, you can put it back and you can take one of the others. And I said to Dan, oh, I'm just going to go take a look and see what's on the shelf. I got halfway along the top shelf. There was only about, the shelves were only about that long, two shelves. I got halfway along the shelf. I reached in and I pulled out this book. And I said to Dan, You're not going to believe this. You know that book we've been talking about for the last couple of hours? I said, And do you know what he said? You must have put it there. I said, how could I have put it there? I said, you've been with me. I said, look, I'm not, I'm not even carrying a bag. And he said, wow. He said, that's pretty incredible, isn't it? So actually, this triggered, obviously, even more discussion on it. But this, this book, by the way, um, I actually later discovered that more copies had been released in the UK because it was released in the UK at about the same time. And of course, the, the book wasn't 
taken off the shelves in the UK. So you can still find some uh, first editions that were actually published in the UK, as opposed to the few that uh, were actually released in, in the US. This is uh, the guy who they're working with, Uri Geller. Uri Geller, and of course, he became an employee of the CIA, basically. And uh, he was used in many occasions to uh, try to get Russian diplomats to change their agenda. You know, if a Russian diplomat was going to be required to sign a particular agreement or whatever, then Geller, it would be arranged for Geller to be in the same room or be on the same flight and supposedly try and influence the guy. The bottom line was that, you know, the CIA, the NSA were prepared to give this activity some credence. Closer to the current time, let me introduce you to this lady. This is Jill Bolte Taylor. Jill Bolte Taylor is a neuroanatomist. And in the mid 1990s, she was a very, very well respected neuroanatomist. She was in her mid 30s. And in her mid 30s, she was already holding positions in academia that were normally only held by people like 20 years her senior. And she was specializing in her research on the stroke, the effects of a stroke, what causes strokes, the impact of the stroke, and how people could recover from strokes. Well, one morning, I think it was late 96 or early 97, she woke up one morning and she felt a bit groggy. And she hadn't had a heavy night the night before, but she just didn't feel good. And as she started to go through her morning routine, she felt worse and worse and worse. And then today she tells the story through the proverbial rose-colored glasses. And she tells the story today and she says, well, so there I was, this very well-respected young uh, neuroanatomist at the peak of her profession, studying strokes. And I suddenly realized I was having a stroke. And she said, I thought, oh, this is exciting. <laughs> I told you the rose-colored glasses kicked in. This is exciting. I've been researching this, now I get to experience it firsthand. <laughs> well, that's as she tells the story sort of 14, 15 years later. Well, what was going through her brain was a blood clot. And this blood clot shut down her left brain. So all of a sudden, she was experiencing reality through her right brain. And it rocked her worldview. Because first of all, she said that she couldn't actually determine where she started and finished. She was just part of a great amorphous. Her mother became her primary carer. And as her mother was looking after her, she began to realize that she could predict what was going to happen. She would know who was going to come into the room. She would actually know whether or not the person was coming to see her out of pure curiosity or because they were genuinely concerned for her. And if she wanted something, she would think, oh, I could do with an apple. And then her mother would come in a few seconds later and say, would you like an apple, dear? Anyway, as these experiences started to unfold, she realized that this was truly remarkable. And she was getting insights that she couldn't even have begun to consider when she was doing, doing her research in the academic environment. So now she decided that she had to find a way to take these insights and this knowledge back to the physical empirical material realm. But this was a bit of a problem because she'd lost all her motor skills. So she literally went through a process of re-education of the left brain. A long process, but eventually she managed to achieve it. And that was her motivation the whole time. She said, my motivation was to share my knowledge and my insights with my colleagues in the neuroanatomy community. And she wrote this book. This book? Yeah, that book. My Stroke of Insight. It's a very, very easy read because her left brain, when she wrote this, had reached the level of about a 14 or 15-year-old. So the book doesn't actually try and analyze what had occurred, the book is simply an explanation of her experiences. And of course, what she has acknowledged is that you know, basically the right brain has a very, very different role. 
It is the left brain that connects us with the physical empirical material realm. It is the left brain that operates within a linear time-space continuum. The right brain is not constrained in that way. The right brain operates outside the linear time-space continuum. The linear brain connects us with everything, potentially. My hypothesis is that the powers that be, those who think they are the rightful rulers of the planet, know this. And they know that if we are able to awaken this capacity to its fullest extent, we're going to be a massive problem to them. Let's take a look at something else. Let's look at another sacred cow. Let me introduce you to this lady. This is Claire Sylvia. She was living in um, Massachusetts, and she had congenital heart problems. Her life expectancy was, well, her quality of life was appalling, but her life expectancy was uh, very small, very short, because of the heart disease. Anyway, she was working with a hospital, and yes, they, she was on the list to get a transplant, but nothing seemed to, um, to manifest. And then she read about another hospital that was starting up a heart tr transplant program. So she contacted that hospital. Um, she went to meet with the, uh, the staff at that hospital, and they said, yep, yeah, absolutely, you're a great candidate for a heart transplant. She got back home, and within a few days, she got a call to say, are you ready? You know, I, I, are you ready? Are you prepared? Are all your affairs in order? Of course, because with a heart transplant, the likelihood is that you might not survive, so you've got to be ready for that. Well, she was ready for it, because her quality of life was atrocious. When they opened her up on the operating table, they discovered that a heart transplant wasn't going to cut it because the heart and the lungs were in such a poor state that she needed a heart-lung transplant. So the hospital contacted the hospital where the, the donor was being prepared and asked them if it was going to be possible to take out the heart and the lungs as one unit. Well, the hospital replied that it was. The heart and lungs were uh, transported to the hospital and put into Claire Sylvia. Now, because of her lifestyle, obviously she didn't drink, she didn't smoke, um, you know, she tended to uh, live on a liquid diet. But when she came round from the anaesthetic, the first thing she said was, God, I could murder a beer and a Kentucky Fried Chicken. And she realized that it wasn't her that had said that. Over the course of the next few weeks, she began to realize that she was no longer just Claire Sylvia. She was Claire Sylvia plus somebody else, the essence of somebody else. And of course, she acknowledged that it was the essence of the donor. Even when she left hospital, she got her driver to pull into a Kentucky Fried Chicken. Whether she had one or not, I'm not sure, but uh, she actually got the driver to pull in. She wrote a book called A Change of Heart, the extraordinary story of a man's heart in a woman's body. The sensation of this essence of another being grew in her, and she felt this phenomenal desire, this driving force to meet with the family of the donor. Now, this is absolute antithesis to the uh, medical community. You, know, you cannot meet the donor. Never shall the recipient and the donor ever meet. And it's an area that uh, isn't even explored. It's just black and white. They will never meet. She tried to persuade the administration of the hospital to um, tell her who the donor was, but they wouldn't tell her. And then she had this, this drive. She couldn't suppress it. And she got a friend of hers to help her and did the research. And obviously, she knew the date. She knew the approximate location. And she was able to establish that the donor was an 18-year-old male who had been killed in a motorbike accident. The motorbike had gone into a tree. Obviously, the guy had died from terrible head trauma, but the rest of the physical vehicle was intact. Well, she did actually meet with the family, and, of course, the experience she had with the family perhaps helps us to understand why the medical establishment is so anti-recipients um, meeting with donors' family, because some of the family embraced her because they were happy to at least sense that they had part of their lost relative, but other members of the family just couldn't take it. And it actually caused a massive split 
in the donor's family because of uh, you know, her contact with them. This story did actually make it into the, uh, into the British media. This was the headline. I was given a young man's heart and started craving Kentucky Fried Chicken, beer and Kentucky Fried Chicken. My daughter said I even walks like a man. Well, there's a, another story here I'm going to share with you, which didn't have such a, uh, say a good ending, because Claire learned to live with the essence of this young male that was within her. She recognized that it had to be a partnership from this point forward. She was no longer just Claire Sylvia. This is a, a very unfortunate incident. Let me just read it. This is from uh, um, the media. In a newspaper article published in 2006, Mr. Graham, the recipient of a hut, said he felt an instant and unusual attachment when he met his donor's widow. Now, I don't know the circumstances how he met the donor's widow, but I would hazard a guess that it wasn't uh, dissimilar from Claire Sylvia's experience, and he had a desire to meet with the widow. He said, I felt like I had known her for years. He said, I couldn't keep my eyes off her, I just stared. Well, it wasn't just his eyes he couldn't keep off her, because he ended up marrying her. But now, 12 years after the operation, Mrs. Graham's life has been rocked by another tragedy. Mr. Graham, the recipient, killed himself with a shotgun in circumstances that I now know to be identical to those which claimed Mr. Cottle, the original donor's, life. His friends said he had shown no signs of being depressed and were at a loss to explain his sudden death. According to scientists, there are more than 70 documented cases of transplant patients taking on some of their personality traits of organ donors. Actually, today it's hundreds. It's hundreds of examples of organ recipients taking on characteristics of the donor. Some more so than others. Some, no, no obvious sign whatsoever. In the most extreme case, there's a guy who absolutely hated classical music, but the donor, and this was actually of a kidney, the donor was a very accomplished um, classical musician. And the recipient, although he didn't become a musician, but he developed a love for classical music. But I've got to tell you that if, God forbid, but if ever I'm a candidate for a transplant, I'm going to want to know who the bloody donor is. Because when I was exploring this with the medical profession, and a guy I've become a very good friend with, a retired orthopedic surgeon, and we were talking about this, and he said, Ian, he said, there are things that we just don't talk about in the medical profession. And he said, certainly things we don't write about. He said, but this situation occurs with blood transfusions. He said that's why when we have a patient who has some serious trauma with a, a loss of a lot of blood and we have to give them you know, many, many pints of, of blood over a period of time, we have to keep them sedated. Because with a blood transfusion, apparently the characteristics aren't permanent. As the uh, transfusion is taking place, apparently it can cause very, very significant personality changes into the person receiving the transfusion. And that's why th this particular doctor, he said, I absolutely respect the decisions of the Jehovah's Witnesses and others who refuse blood transfusions. He said they know the circumstances, or they, know, they know the consequences, but he would never force them to change their minds. The bottom line is here, the bottom line is here that there are aspects of our physiology and of our consciousness that go way beyond the current level of the reductionist Newtonian scientific explanation. Let me just throw an experiment here. Can you uh, sort of just, if you're in the front row, turn around, but can you randomly just point at anybody else in the room, please? If you're at the back, just randomly point at anybody else in the room. Okay, now can you point to yourself, please? Point to yourself. Look at where you're pointing. The vast majority of you automatically did this. That's where you subconsciously acknowledge that the true self resides. Not here, not even here. Here. There's an organization in the U.S. called the Heart Math Foundation that's been in existence now for, I think, about 20, 25 years. 
And the, the Heart Math Foundation has been doing a lot of work on the right brain heart connect. And part of their research involves measuring the electromagnetic field around the body, and its strongest is here. The strongest point is here. And the people that they work with, they've analyzed the way in which they live their lifestyle, and they found that the people who have the most balanced personality are those who take time to sit in silence, those who take time to walk out in nature, and particularly walking around in bare feet, bare feet on the beach or bare feet in the fields. And in fact, this is an old uh, uh, graphic with the toroid because now they've updated it because they believe that the toroidal force actually goes beneath the feet. And what do we wear on our feet today? Leather and rubber, insulators. So we're actually insulating ourselves from that uh, greater connection. When I was in Central America, one of the uh, remarkable experiences I had, I was staying with a family in Belize, and um, the husband went off to do the shopping, and he'd been gone about 20 minutes or so, and the wife said, oh, gosh, I meant to get him to get some eggs. And she walked over to a big tree in the garden, and she leant up against the tree, and she just said, I need some eggs. And I said, what? And she said, oh, no, she said, you know, the trees, they, we communicate through the trees. She said, you know, we've done this for generations. I said, yeah, right, okay. okay. <laughs> anyway, it was about a couple of hours later that her husband came back, and as he walked through the gate, the first thing he did was he reached into his bag, he said, you wanted some eggs? Now, whether it's the trees or not, I don't know. But the reality is that both of them actually understood that if they wanted something, if they actually walked over to the tree, whether the tree was the genuine catalyst or whether it was just the, the prop, who knows. But all of this is dismissed, of course, by mainstream science as just lunacy. And if you perceive that, then, well, that's the way it is. But, of course, the reality is that more and more people are starting to recognize that there's a hell of a lot going on that we can't explain. Let me just ask another question. Randomly, how many people do you think, how many players, how many personalities live inside your head or wherever it is? How many? Five? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Let's say without for the moment. How many, how many without and how many with? How many think it's one? You think it's one? So you never talk to yourself. My, my um, ex-wife, um, one of the things I've always done is I've always used the opportunity, sort of, particularly when I'm driving, to sort of kick stuff around in my head. And my ex-wife was never able to accept that when I was driving, I'd be going along going, And she'd go, so who are you talking to now then? <laughs> and I'd go, oh, I'm just trying to sort of mull over something in my mind. Well, of course, to consider that, uh, you know, you possibly have more than one person or more than one player inside your head is the fast track to uh, a course of Prozac. <laughs> <laughs> if you acknowledge it. But actually, even the BBC, this is from a BBC article, and even the, the BBC actually acknowledged that uh, voices in the head are normal. But that maybe, you see, that was just the um, sowing the seeds for, uh, you know, the mind control. Um, has anybody ever heard the name David Shaler? David Shaler, okay. This is a guy who used to work with the security services. He uh, used to work with MI5. And he blew the whistle, tried to blow the whistle on the security services, the British security services, uh, trying to assassinate Gaddafi in uh, 1997. Um, well, he had to run, go on the run to France, and uh, where he was eventually arrested, taken back to the UK, put into jail, and uh, then, tragically, um, in 2007, he declared himself to be the Messiah uh, in, in a public um, uh, presentation. I, I was actually the speaker before him, and then he got on stage and declared himself to be the Messiah. And I'd known David for quite some time, but um, afterwards, after the talk, I saw him. He was holding court with a few people. And I guess that as I walked past the room, I must have gone, fuck, something like that. 
because a few weeks later, David went on to one of the satellite TV stations and he was being interviewed. And you'll find this clip on YouTube. And David's being interviewed by uh, the host. And there was a British comedian who was sort of there to provide the balance. And um, so the host was saying, you know, so David, you know, you're, you're the Messiah. Yep, yep, yep. You know, and she got him to sort of talk through the process of when he became the Messiah. But this comedian, this comedian said, so let me get this right. He said, um, if you're the Messiah, then surely it follows that the Antichrist is here on earth right now. And David Shelley said, oh, yeah, 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 he is, he is. So uh, the comedian said, so, so who is it then? And uh, Shayla said, well, actually, I'm, I'm not sure I should probably say on the television. But the host said, yeah, come on, come on, who is it? Thinking he was going to say George Bush, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld. And he said, well, actually, it's a guy called Ian Crane. <laughs> and, uh, of course, the host who knew me, <laughs> her jaw just drops. And the comedian, of course, says, who the fuck's Ian Crane? Well, this story has a purpose here, because David Shaler at the time, in the weeks leading up to this presentation, was staying with some guys in a house, it was a rooming house, they were primarily students and young professionals living in this big old house in Bristol, and David had a room in the middle of the house, it was on the second floor, right in the middle of the house, and after his announcement that he was the Messiah, the other guys in the house said, David, you've got to go, you know, <laughs> sorry mate, you just, we just can't. We're not up to living with the Messiah. <laughs> anyway, a, f a couple of weeks later, the guys who had given David the room had, were going out for a drink, and they invited the girl who was living under David Shaler's room. They'd never seen her before because their schedules never, never crossed, so she would come and go and come and go, and they'd never met. But then they saw her, and they said, hey, you want to come out for a drink? So... They took her out for a drink and said, you know, how are you getting on, how are you settling in, everything else. She said, that's yeah, great. She said, actually, it's a lot better now than when I first moved in. And they said, why is that? She said, because I kept hearing these voices in my head saying, you are the Messiah. You are the Messiah. You are the chosen one. Now, she knew nothing about David Shaler. So, of course, the supposition here is that David Shaler was specifically targeted to effectively... Um, demonize himself, as it were, and marginalize himself so that any claims he made as a former MI5 operative were immediately dismissed because he'd lost the plot. So that's a, that's a first-hand uh, experience of, of the mind control. And I think that, you know, there is no question that we, have, we can develop the capability and the capacity to, uh, to resist that. But this process, this process of shutting down this right brain activity, it continues, of course, from the vaccinations, and we're seeing this increasing agenda to get Ritalin into our youth. The UK last year spent 45 million pounds on Ritalin. Ritalin is a psychoactive drug. The mainstream media has been running articles. This is from uh, one of the major papers in the UK, the Daily Mail. Thousands of hyperactive children are being given Ritalin, which can stunt growth or even schizophrenia drugs. Are they victims of greedy drug firms? No shit. And doctors too quick to diagnose a condition many say doesn't exist. We know that Ritalin causes young people to self-harm, to go into deep depression, and um, uh, to commit suicide. Barry Trower on, uh, on, I've lost track of days, Thursday, Barry Trower, talked about Bridge End in South Wales, where there was a cluster of suicides. There were two, uh, the government refused to, British government refused to initiate any independent um, investigation into this cluster of suicides, but there were two um, uh, professors who undertook to do personal research and investigation. One concluded, the same as Barry, that every one of these teen suicides lived within 80 meters of a phone mast. The other professor not only acknowledged that they lived within 80 meters of a phone mast, but also established that every one of the teen suicides was either on or had recently come off a course of Ritalin. And of course, uh, you know, Ritalin is just the nursery for the more pernicious adult drugs like Prozac.
Now, if you want to see the effects of these drugs, there is an outstanding website. And this outstanding website, all you've got to remember is SSRI Database. SSRI Database. SSRI stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor, Antidepressants. And this, this website is maintained by concerned medical professions across the planet. Now, this is only a very small percentage of medical professionals who are contributing to this database. And you can search this database. When you download it, I mean, it'll be the top. When you search, when you punch into your search engine, SSRI database, this will be the top link. And you can search. You simply click on the top here. What do you want to search by? You know, the date, the drug, what occurred, where. I mean, I, I, you know, this, this is a slide from um, last November, and I was looking at, uh, you know, the suicides and the we've got suicide, suicide, personality drained away, huge weight gain, violence, death. And, of course, this is the common denominator in all high school shootings. If it's not, um, if it's not SSRIs, it'll be steroids or a combination of the two. Here's another one again for the UK. Suicide violence, standoff with police, suicide, suicide, suicide. And look at the date. I mean, all of these are literally within a few days. When you see this database, you will be absolutely staggered by the incidents that are reported here. And remember, this is only a very, very small percentage because this is only from those doctors who have actually signed up to participate in this process. And the, in the UK now, the average age at which women are having their first child is now over 30 for the first time since records began. Two reasons for this. One is economic, because young people can't even begin to think how the hell they can have one of them stopping work and have an extra mouth to feed. So they're putting off having their first child until they're over 30. At the other end of the social scale, you have the teen pregnancies. Because the teenagers know that the fastest way to get out of the family home is to get pregnant and be provided with a local authority housing. This dichotomy is causing the establishment a bit of a problem because the 30-year-old mothers are much better informed and in many cases are refusing to have their children vaccinated. At the lower end of the social spectrum, they are now providing, the establishment is now providing incentives for mothers to get their children diagnosed with ADHD and to get them put on a course of Ritalin. If you have one child diagnosed ADHD and the doctor prescribes a course of Ritalin, you become regarded as their carer. And under the British social security system, you can now receive 600 pounds as an allowance for being their carer. If you have two children diagnosed Ritalin, you get 1,200 pounds. If you have three children diagnosed with ADHD and prescribed with Ritalin, you can apply to be given a car. That car will be taxed and insured and the fuel will be provided by the state because you have three children who have been diagnosed ADHD and require your full-time attention and you obviously need to transport them. So what we have today on the Sink Estates, at the lower end of the social strata, we have a very, very high level of young people who are effectively under the chemical kosh. Now, Ritalin is not actually technically an SSRI. In fact, the chemical structure of Ritalin is very, very similar to cocaine. But it has a very, very different effect on the developing brain than it does on the developed brain. And pharmacologists can't actually explain this. I mean, it's what Barry was saying yesterday. You know, the developing brain is a very, very different piece of kit than the developed brain. 
There is a professor of bioethics at Manchester University in the UK, Professor John Harris. And at least twice a year, this guy gets articles in the British mainstream media promoting the idea that Ritalin should be freely available over the counter in all colleges and universities in the UK because it enhances concentration. Whereas in the developing brain, it turns the kids into zombies and leads them to you know, self-harm or worse, commit suicide. This is all part of the process. It's all part of shutting them down. And of course, to make matters worse, you know, we feed them these outrageous drinks that are loaded with, uh, with the stimulants, such as caffeine. And then, of course, we've got the, uh, the, the junk food industry. And of course, we're seeing the battle in the press right now because following the recent Harvard report, which stated that um, actually there's no real difference between GM foods or organic foods and non-organic foods, but in the US it's very different because there's hardly, it's, it's not only impossible to find organic soil in the US now, thanks to the pernicious agenda of Monsanto planting seeds all the way down the West Coast and on the eastern side of the Rockies so that the prevailing trade winds just blow the seeds right across the country. But it's very different in Europe, very, very different. But we're seeing this agenda increased. And of course, um, I've been working with Scott Tips for a number of years now. But when I recorded my presentation on Codex five years ago, where I said that basically the agenda here is that the, the biotech industry want to completely eradicate all organic farming and effectively want to replace all farming with genetically modified foods so that, of course, they can patent them and they want to eradicate the natural health industry. And the pharmaceutical industry in particular was employing consultants to trawl the forums, the natural health forums. And any time there was a discussion on my video presentation on Codex, saying, oh, you know, I've just seen this video by Ian Crane talking about the, uh, the biotech agenda and the pharmaceutical agenda. Is there any truth in it? And these trolls would come back, no, no, there's no truth in it whatsoever. Ian Crane's just a conspiracy theorist. So on um, May the 1st last year, when this piece of legislation was introduced in the EU, and it has the wonderful acronym of THUMPED, the Traditional Herbal Medicines Products Directive, which gives all EU countries two years to remove all non-approved natural healthcare products from their shelves by the 30th of April next year. So when this is, this is from the front page of one of the major um, publications in the UK, and the natural health community went, oh my God, it's true. And so after this, for the first time, I was invited to speak to uh, one of the uh, groups you know, who were trying to um, maintain natural health. And I said, well, you know, this is like bolting the door after the horse has run. And they said, oh, yeah, but we didn't believe it was true. And I said, well, with all due respect, it is your apathy and your willful ignorance and your abdication that has effectively led to the death of your industry. And this is still the case. I mean, the natural health community in Europe, I still don't think, has actually grasped the magnitude of what is happening here. Because after April the 30th next year, to even order natural health products from the US to be shipped into Europe will be treated exactly the same as if you were importing cannabis. <laughs> well, I tell you what, the way things are going, you've got more chance of legalizing cannabis than you have natural health products. All right? And that, you know, people say, oh, well, that's, you know, we'll, we'll just deal with it anyway. Well, that's okay, as long as you understand that effectively from that point, you know, you're going to be looking over your shoulder all the time. You know, this is not the way forward. We've got to make the changes here. You know, and, and of course, you know, this, the media, the advertising that I was talking about, you know, in the US, it is estimated that a 16-year-old is exposed to over one million advertisements in the course of their life. You know, that's from TV, the billboards, the computer, everything. One million advertisements. You know, and it's just keeping people locked in. I, mean, I think I said yesterday, you know, George Carlin famously said, those who don't read newspapers and those who don't watch TV know a damn sight more than, than those who do. 
You know, I'm gonna, um, and by the way, I, this, is, this shocked me. You want to see where Denmark is in the league table of uh, those who watch TV? Third, after the United States and Greece, although Greece has gone right down now because they're rioting on the streets, rightly so. Because they've realized that what's put out on the TV is a crock of crap. But the US, look at the US. The US. You know, when, when I lived in the US, if I had to, if I had to, when I was staying with um, you know, some of my colleagues in the US, I mean, the moment they got up in the morning, the TV was on in the main room, the TV was on in the kitchen. You know, and in some cases, they had it on in their office all day. You know, in Europe, we haven't maybe quite got to that stage, but I was, you know, all you can see, right? I mean, basically, Switzerland is b bottom of the league here at two and a half hours, and uh, Denmark at uh, well, third on the table here with four hours. And it's worse for children. Of course, because uh, basically, they, I mean, I stopped, I took all the TVs away from my house, and now my former partner, the TVs are gone too. And happened when I, my two-year-old son was watching SpongeBob SquarePants, and he was like this. And I said, Tristan. And he said, Tristan. Tristan. Said, yeah, Dad, yeah, Dad. And I said, oh, that's it. Oh, my God, TV doesn't work anymore. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, he watches DVDs, but at least we can select what he's watching. I don't know, has anybody seen the film They Live by John Carpenter? If you haven't seen it, go Google it. it. The first 20 minutes is a bit tough to get through. But once you get through the first 20 minutes, you won't be able to turn it off. You know, this film was released in 1984, a remarkably prescient film. It's actually quite interesting, of course, it was released in 1984. Of course, we've heard about uh, Harp. We heard Barry talking about the, uh, the phones. Now, I, I'm in the habit, you know, when I um, carry my phone, apart from throwing it on the floor, but I carry my phone in my left pocket, and, and that's purely because I'm in the habit of if I hold the phone to my ear, which I try not to, I try and use it on um, a loudspeaker as much as possible, but if I hold it to my ear, it's going up to my left brain. The vast majority of people, especially kids, of course, hold their phone to their right brain. And as you heard from Barry, it is the child's brain that is far more susceptible to the EMF here than the adult brain. I mean, actually, I'm, from my perspective, I, I know that there are those who don't like legislation, but you know, in, in the absence of information from the uh, telecoms industry, I would make it illegal for any child under the age of 16 to have a phone. And when you see kids, young babies in buggies doing this, because their parents have given them the phone to keep them amused, but they're doing this. And the phone is like this far from their head. And it's the developing brain. It's attacking the front temporal lobes here. The chemtrails, you know, covered so eloquently by, uh, by Frank and, uh, and Desiree. The fluoride in the water. You know, fluoride is a, a toxin. It's a toxic waste product from the aluminium smelting industry. It was used by both the Soviets and the Germans to keep their prison populations docile. It's been in the Maine's water supply in Ireland for 40 years. And it's why a lot of people believe that the Irish have effectively just allowed their country to be taken away from them. And as somebody made the observation earlier, you know, how far away are we from this? Not far, especially if these governments get their way with the cashless societies. In Italy, from I think it's July of next year, all cash transactions will be limited to 50 euro. They're already limited, I think it's to 1,000 euro right now. And I don't know if you're aware, but BNI, the Italian bank, announced on May the 31st of this year at midnight that it would not open again until July the 1st. So for one month, all people who had BNI accounts were effectively unable to access their accounts. Yep. They won't handle cash, exactly. Yep. I mean, Sweden is certainly you know, going down the road. Of course, a, a massive part of this agenda is to make sure that all transactions are traceable and to shut down the black economy. 
to make sure everything is, uh, is taxed. But it is the thin end of the wedge, of course. And I mean, the, rea the reality is that uh, if we have the opportunity for parallel currencies, I know you don't in Denmark, but in the UK, you've got parallel currencies springing up in more and more towns. So, you know, obviously, we've got to make sure. I, oh, by the way, I function in cash as much as possible. I mean, obviously, I have to you know, use cards and um, you know, internet transactions, but it's cash whenever possible. We've got to keep the cash alive. So this is my hypothesis. What is happening is that more and more people are beginning to spontaneously wake up to the fact that this ain't all there is. That there's way more to life than just living in this construct with a little bit of insight into this on the occasional weekend or annual vacation. More and more people are looking for balance in their lives. More and more people are beginning to realize that they don't need to function in that construct. Many people, unfortunately, are still enslaved by the salary, and nobody understands that better than me. Because one of the reasons I, it took me seven years to leave the oil industry after my experience in Kuwait was I couldn't imagine life without a salary going into my bank account every month. It's a massive step to take. But once you take it, one of the things that I certainly learned is that the universe never lets you down. How many people here are self-employed? Okay. Most of you, if not all of you, will have experienced a time when you had no idea how the next month's rent or mortgage or bills were going to be paid, correct? All the time. <laughs> but most of the time... But most of the time, something occurs that brings in the funds, yes? All the time, exactly. You know, we can't explain it. We can't explain it. You know, sometimes we're right down to the wire. We have no idea, you know, how, where the money's coming from. You know, we've tried everything. We've done everything we should be doing in terms of the marketing or whatever for our products, for our businesses. But the money just doesn't seem to be flowing in. And then, you know, on the day the bill is due, something happens. You know, we get an order out of the blue. We can't explain it. It's a causal synchronicity. You know? Consider the possibility that it's our right brain actually participating in the process, the right brain heart connect, connecting with everything else that's out there and keeping us on track. You know, there's an increasing recognition within the scientific community, particularly in the quantum realm. And, um, you know, we saw, uh, I think it was Lars the other night talking about uh, Persinger, Michael Persinger, and his uh, work with uh, experiments with the God helmet, the Karen helmet. Well, what was interesting was that, obviously, ultimately, once again, just like um, Russell Targ and Hal Puthoff, this research was sequestered by the National Security Agency. But, um, you know, what he was trying to do, what he wanted to do with the Karen helmet was stimulate the front temporal lobes with you know, low electromagnetic fields and stimulate the mystical experience. So when he announced that he was looking for volunteers, he had all these aging hippies queuing up at his door who thought this might be cheaper than LSD. <laughs> that really wasn't his point. And what he wanted to do was he wanted to get committed materialists to try on the helmet to see what they would say when they put on the helmet. And uh, he did this with a British psychologist by the name of Susan Blackmore. And um, when she put on the helmet, I mean, she absolutely insists that, you know, it's not possible to have any experience that can't be explained. And she put on the helmet, and she, to this day, refuses to discuss what happened when she was wearing the helmet, <laughs> which would indicate that, um, which would indicate that you know, something occurred, which, if she talked about it, might actually rock her worldview. Now, a few years ago, I became familiar with the work of a guy called Alberto Vololdo. Because in the course of my research over the years, another area that I have a, I've always had a fascination for is the knowledge and the wisdom of the indigenous peoples from around the planet and their mythology and cosmology. And that's why I was in Central America, actually, in, uh, in 2000, when I was researching the mythology and cosmology of the Mayans. Well, I became familiar with the work of Alberto Vololdo, who's um, um, an anthropologist who's been working with the Cuero in Peru for about 40, 45 years now. And Alberto Vololdo was fascinated by the Cuero because the Cuero, 
everyone believed had been lost to the world, absolutely lost to the world, because everyone believed that they'd been murdered by the conquistadors back in the uh, 16th, late 16th century. Um, but they hadn't been murdered. They'd been chased up into the Andes and were living at 16,500 feet. And they came out of the Andes in the mid-1960s, and everyone was shocked to see these people. And these people are uh, very evident by you know, their very highly colored hats and ponchos. And they came out of the mountains because they said that they had nursed a prophecy, they had nursed a knowledge that they needed to share with humanity at this particular juncture. Now, this was in the 1960s. Now, Alberto happened to be a young uh, student at the time, and he was really, really uh, interested by what these guys had to say, and he decided that he was going to sort of devote his life to studying, working with these guys, you know, and studying them, and helping them to share their insight. And what it was that they came down to what they call the lower world to share was that for 25 generations, and they counted off the generations, for 25 generations, they've been holding up, up in the high Andes with this insight that we are fast approaching a very unique time in our evolutionary process, a unique time for humanity. And they wanted to come down into the lower world to share their insights because they felt that humanity might have a better chance of maximizing this opportunity if they helped to raise awareness of it. And a couple of years ago, well, three years ago now, I decided that I actually wanted to go and spend some time with these guys because I wanted to hear for myself what it was that they had to say about this unique juncture in our evolutionary process. So... Um, I called the number on Alberto's website. I thought, well, you know, at least I can ask if it's possible for me to join one of his tours. I mean, on the website, it said that, you know, priority was given to people following his Four Winds program. Let me just ask, is anybody, is anybody familiar with Alberto Valaldo here? No? Okay, you will be when I finished. And uh, anyway, I called his, um, uh, the number on his website, and this guy answered the phone, and I said, look, I'm just calling to see if it's possible for me to join Alberto's tour to Peru next um, June. This, was, this would have been June of 2010. Anyway, uh, I said to the guy, you know, by the way, who am I talking to? And he said, actually, you're talking to Alberto Valoldo. And he said, who am I talking to? And I said, well, my name's uh, Ian Crane. And there was a silence, and he said, well, Ian R. Crane? And I said, yeah. He said, I don't believe this. He said, two days ago, I'd never heard of you. He said, but um, yesterday morning, I was watching a video of, and it was my Codex Alimentarius presentation. So, you know, this connectivity had kicked in, and he, you know, anyway, once we'd finished blowing smoke up each other's butts for the next sort of few minutes, then he said, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's possible for you to come along. He said, but you've got to remember, Ian, he said, all the other people that are going to be on the tour are people who are following my Four Winds program, and they're going to want to, you know, spend some time with these people. So, yeah, you're just going to have to sort of come and sit in the background and, you know, enjoy the, uh, the trip. And I said, yeah, okay, fine, yeah, no problem. Anyway, come the June, and I was really looking forward to going, and I thought, I've got to find a way to actually sit down with these guys, because I really want to sort of explore you know, what it was that they came out to, to share. Anyway, on my first night in Peru, we were staying at Cuzco, which is at about 11,500 feet. You know, I'm, I've often traveled into uh, high altitude places, so I knew the risks of you know, high altitude. I thought I'd taken all the preparations to deal with the altitude, but at two o'clock in the morning, I woke up you know, with the extreme nausea, and I knew I'd got hit with the altitude sickness. Anyway, I was staying in a, in a room in an old hacienda and had to uh, go down the stairs, but I missed my footing, fell down the stairs, slid headfirst across the room, smacked my head on the far wall, and had my ankle laying underneath me at an extreme angle. Now, I was so nauseous, I couldn't be asked to move, so I simply called down to reception, asked them to bring two bags of ice up, put one bag of ice under my head and the other bag of ice under my ankle. And the following morning, I went to the hospital. Sure enough, I'd broken my ankle. The next day, I managed to get some crutches, but obviously, it was going to be a little bit difficult for me to join the treks up into the uh, Andes to meet with these people. But, you know, hey, what could I do? So, the following day, I got on the coach 
to meet these people. The rest of the crew were walking up into the mountains. And I thought, well, all I can do is sort of find a nice spot, sit down and enjoy the scenery. And I did that. And this is when the voices in your head really start to kick in, don't they? Because the voice in the left brain was going, well, this is bloody marvellous, isn't it? You've spent all this money, you've come all this way, and what have you got to show for it? A broken ankle, and you're sitting on a rock like a bloody gnome. And the right brain kicks in and says, whoa, 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 just chill, just relax, just see how it unfolds. You know, it's, look, there's nothing you can do about it. You're not going to go home, so you might as well just sit and relax. Well, this was going on, you know, for about an hour or so, and then I saw one of these guys walking down the side of the mountain. And I followed the path, and I thought, well, he's got to come close to me, you know, maybe I'll sort of shout hi and see what happens. Well, I didn't need to shout hi, because it was very clear he was making a beeline to come and sit with me. But he didn't speak any English, I didn't speak any Cuero or Spanish, really, or certainly not Spanish that he could understand. But he sat there, patiently, and about half an hour later, another member of the Cuero started coming down the same path and came along and came and sat down with them. And the two of them are chatting away, and every now and again, of course, they point to the plaster cast on my ankle and laugh. And then a little while later, a third member of the Cuero came along in the path. Now, this was the youngest member of the Cuero group working with Alberto. Uh, it was a, a lady. She was 38 years of age, and her name was Velma. And she came along, and she sat with the group, and she spoke perfect English. So now I had my translator. And so for the next four hours, I had the undivided attention of these guys. And they said to me, when the rest of the group came down, they said, uh, through Velma, they said, we, we can meet here tomorrow, if you like. And I said, well, I might be going on a different coach. And they said, OK, we'll find out which coach you're put on. We'll make sure that we know where that coach is going, and we'll come and meet with you. This happened for four days. And on the fifth day, as we were getting on the coaches to go back to the hotel, Alberto tapped me on the shoulder and he said, with a smile on his face. But he said, Ian, when we get back to the hotel, he said, can we have a chat in the bar? And I said, yeah, sure. So when I got to back to the hotel, he said, um, Ian, uh, how much are you paying these guys? I said, paying them? I said, I'm not paying them anything. He said, well, I am. <laughs> he said, I'm paying them to conduct ceremony up in the High Andes you know, with the building of their mandalas and everything. I think a wonderful process. But he said, I'm paying them to do that and then to spend time with the people who are doing the Four Winds program. He said, these guys normally take two to three hours to build their mandala. He said, they're doing it in 35 minutes and then rushing off, and the next time I look for them, they're sitting down with you. He said, look, if it happens tomorrow, can you send them back up in the mountains? I said, okay, fine. So anyway, when they turned up the next day, I said, look, guys, there's a you know, little bit of bad feeling with Alberto. And, uh, you know, he really wants you to be back in the mountains. And they all burst out laughing. And I said, what are you laughing at? And they said, because Alberto, more than anybody, knows that everybody is where they're supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> and the primary reason that I wanted to speak with them, and of course I'd read the stuff that Alberto had written about, but I wanted to hear it from them, is because what they say, and Alberto confirms that the message hasn't changed ever since he first went, met with them over 40 years ago. They believe that this particular time in our evolutionary process is very, very significant, and there is something that is occurring right now which is giving us the opportunity to awaken what we have been told is junk DNA. And that process is this. The solar storms. And Alberto says that he knew nothing about the forecast solar activity that started in October of 2011 and runs right through until May of 2013. Alberto said he knew nothing about this. And it wasn't until these guys told him about it in 1966 or whatever it was that he went away, did his research, and obviously established that, yes, there was very strong solar activity forecast at this period. Now, these guys absolutely are committed to this belief that the solar activity is part of the process that is triggering our awakening. I don't know whether that's true or not. I mean, it might be a crock of crap, but something is triggering the awakening because, as I said, you know, we've gone from, I've gone from an audience of three in 2003 to, you know, multiple events like this during the course of the year 
one day and two day workshops with average attendances of pushing 100. It would have been unthinkable a few years ago. Of course, the mainstream media acknowledges this, uh, this process in a different way. Huge solar flare will bring an end to the world in months, and we're ready for it. This is the equivalent of a British redneck. And it's dismissed in the media by this. It says, the sun hits a peak of activity every 11 years or so. We can expect a few more solar flares over the coming months, but mostly these will have no effect. The problems would start if we got hit by a massive flare like the one in 1859. Now, the one in 1859 was very, very significant. But at the time, of course, we didn't have the attachment to the technology that we have today. But what it did do was it fried all the telegraph wires. It took down the telegraph system, which was the closest thing that we had then to what we have now. It says a repeat today would be devastating. Satellites, mobile phone networks, and power grids would be crippled. But would it bring society to its knees? Well, when I, yes, exactly. <clears throat> when I shared this with Aquara, I said, so if this happens, if the solar storm kicks in and it wipes out all of the things that we've come to rely on, you know, how would that affect them? They said, well, you wouldn't need them. You wouldn't need them. Because the awakening would be triggered to such a massive extent, we would enter a realm of consciousness that right now we, is so far beyond the bounds of our perception, we cannot even begin to comprehend. Now, this is very interesting because it fits right in with the research of a guy called Terence McKenna. Anybody familiar with Terence McKenna? Okay, when he did his research on, uh, when he put together the time wave zero, which he got from the I Ching, he knew nothing about the Mayan long count calendar, but he used key events through history to put together his evolutionary process. And he came up with the fact that we reached the peak of this awakening process, and when he was doing this, by the way, it was the late 60s, early 70s, he said, we reached the peak of this awakening process on November the 17th, 2012. And in his um, estimation, he said that this process is logarithmic, and the last 90% of this awakening occurs in the final 17 seconds and the Quero said, when I talked to this, and they said, oh, yes. And many won't survive because they will be taken into places that they have no preparation for. And this is like a, you know, people who supposedly die of a drug overdose. In many cases, they don't die of the pharmacology. They die of fright because the psychoactive opens portals that take them to places that they have no preparation for, and they die of shock. And what the Quero suggest is that if this happened, then people may just die of shock. By the way, when Terence McKenna did discover the Mayan long count calendar, he at least had the good grace to acknowledge that he might be 34 days out. <laughs> now, is something significant going to happen on November the 17th or December the 21st? Personally, I'm not exactly banking on it. What I think, my perception is that December 21st is quite possibly simply going to be the tipping of the fulcrum, the tipping of the balance. And this is what the powers that be, what the establishment are desperately trying to prevent. They're desperately trying to prevent this massive, spontaneous awakening where people immediately see through the veneer. In the Maori tradition, by the way, this particular period is known as the lifting of the veil. And that's, by the way, exactly what the word apocalypse means, the lifting of the veil. Now, the Quero makes some very interesting observations. This is the last few minutes. The Quero makes some very, very interesting observations because they say that this is not guaranteed. This is not a given. We have to participate in the process. They say it's, it's not enough just to acknowledge that we're going to go through this or have this opportunity. We have to behave as though none of this is going to happen. In other words, we have to get involved, we have to try and bring about the changes that we want to see. And then what they told me was really quite remarkable, because they said, if we do this, if we physically get involved, 
if we take an active role in trying to bring about the changes that we want to see, what we will find is that things happen in our lives that will help us with that mission. Asynchronous events will happen that will unfold, miraculous events, remarkable meetings with people will happen that help us collectively move into that opportunity. But they said, you know, it's not enough just to do that either. Because the other thing that we have to do is that we have to take the time to visualize our preferred option in terms of the new reality. But they make an interesting caveat. They say that, yes, we must visualize, but we mustn't have an attachment to that visualization. Because if we have an attachment to that visualization, then we may be limiting the opportunity because that attachment will be limited on the basis of our experience. So we have to put out there the intent to change from the bullshit that we find ourselves dealing with today. But we have to recognize that actually where we may be going may be so amazing, it may be so wonderful, it may be so far beyond the bounds of our current perception that it's actually not even possible to articulate right now. And the Quero make the observation that the combination of this, finding the time, and they're not talking about formal meditation, just finding the time to sit quietly, to visualize that new future, participate in the process, and the combination of this will help to bring about you know, a different arena. Even in the realm of quantum physics, this um, wonderful man, um, Swami, uh, oh gosh, senior moment. <laughs> anyway, he's a quantum physicist. What's his name? Ah, yeah, gotcha. I don't know either. <laughs> Goswami, Goswami, that's it. A quantum physicist. But he, he has developed the phrase quantum activism. Quantum activism. And he's basically saying exactly the same as the Quero, that it's not enough just to try and bring about the changes that we want to uh, bring about in the physical realm, we've also got to recognize the power of our consciousness, particularly the power of the right brain, the heart, that total amorphic field that we're functioning within to bring about the changes. And, you know, what we're looking at is a situation where, you know, we really must be out of our minds, literally, literally, we've got to get out of our left brain, out of our left brain and allow the right brain heart connect to play its full role. And that's why, you know, the, the Quero say we have to get ourselves out of the way. We have to get the ego out of the way and allow, you know, our full potential to materialize. And of course, Alberto Valoldo has developed a word for this, or adopted a word for this, and that is that the next evolutionary process takes us into homo luminous. Homo luminous. And you know, the reality is, I think we're moving there at perhaps a lot faster rate than, you know, we give ourselves credit for. But like I said yesterday, you know, I don't know whether this is definitive. You know, I'm still exploring along with everybody else. But as we said, you know, the existing paradigm is not sustainable in any way, shape, or form. But the critical element here is, and I think it was, uh, somebody said it earlier, if we're waiting for anybody, it was Brigitte. If we're waiting for somebody to come along on that white charger, you've got a long bloody wait. You know, you've got your own white chargers. Well, you are the white charger, get on it. And I'll finish with a, a new take on an old theme, which I think is um, very, very pertinent. You know, I, for one, am a very different person than I was 20 years ago, and I'm sure most of you would make a very similar observation, and I wouldn't have missed this for the world. Thanks for sharing it with me.